Number two, the one thing that Tom has never been accused of is working. He had just gotten back from the war about 10 months before, and he spent his time playing music and visiting the ladies and getting drunk. And he's living with Mama on the farm. He had two older brothers, but they didn't make it back from the war. So Tom's living with Mama, which means his laundry's getting done, and the meals arrive on the table in a timely fashion. If he runs away with Laura Foster to Tennessee, where he knows no one and he has no money, he has to get a job. I don't think he would have run away with Angelina Jolie if that had been part of the deal. Also, he's very close to his mother. He, he's the only male relative that she has left because his mother's a widow, his brothers are dead. He's the man of the family. Laura Foster, when she was eloping, and we know she was eloping because she stole her father's horse and she slung her little bundle of clothes over its withers and off she went. She's eloping. But if Tom goes off with her on that stolen horse, he can never come back. There were places that they would hang you for stealing a horse in 1866. He's going to leave his widowed mother, who has nobody but him, on that farm and go to Tennessee where he knows no one and has to get a job for a girl he's already sleeping with? I don't think so. <laughs> so, here's the way my mind works. Back in my NASCAR period after I rode St. Dale, I got a lot of drivers on speed dial and one of them, Ward Burton, is uh, the only Virginian ever to win the Daytona 500. And You'll find that celebrities treat writers or think of writers the way the rest of us think of hairdressers and plumbers and doctors, which is, do I need one at the moment? <laughs> so as soon as I meet a famous person, they go, oh, write my life. And Ward had been my driver, so I just really admired Ward. He took the million dollars that he got for winning Daytona and bought 800 acres of wilderness land in Virginia, including two miles of river frontage, and gave it back to be a wildlife conservancy. He doesn't own it. He just put it in a protected status forever. So he was my driver, and I admired him, and I said, okay, I mean, let me try to write the story of your life, which turned out to be like trying to housebreak ferrets. So, I never did get that book written. Ward has the attention span of popcorn. But, in the course of trying to write about him, to quote Patsy Cline, I forgot more than you'll ever know about him. So, one day, I asked him, tell me about how you got your first dog. And I knew they were a family that, that had dogs because they were the sort of, they were a country family and they liked to take 22 rifles. He had two brothers that were way younger. Uh, but they liked to go out in the woods with their 22s and shoot beer cans and run rabbits and chase squirrels. So I said, tell me about your first dog. He said, well, my daddy and I agreed when I was six years old we wanted a dog to help us run rabbits in the woods, and we wanted one of those little red and white Snoopy dogs, a beagle, or as Ward pronounces it, a bagel. <laughs> so he said, Daddy looked in the newspaper, and there was an ad that there was a farmer up in the north county of Halifax, and he had a litter of beagle pups, purebred, ready to leave their mother. So we got in the car one Saturday morning, we drove up there to the farm, and I'm six years old, and we go up there, and there's the pen full of little puppies, and I look at those puppies and I go, I don't want any of them. My dog's not here. Let's go home. And I said, you were six years old? He said, yep. I said, were they really beagles? I'm thinking maybe they were basset hounds or something. He said, no, they were beagles. They were perfect purebred beagles, but they weren't right. I said, okay, what happened then? He said, well, a couple of weeks later, there was a farm near Danville, and he had some puppies. And so we went in the car to that farm, and I went out, and I looked at the puppies there with their mother, and I went, no, they won't do. My dog's not here. Let's go home. Now, at this point, see, I would have been afraid that my father would get tired of taking me on wild goose chases, and I wouldn't get a dog. 
And I was puzzled that a six-year-old boy would be that picky about dogs. Because about five years ago, I wanted a little yappy multi poo or something to sleep in a basket while I was writing in my office. So we went to the dog pound right before Christmas to adopt a puppy for me. And they didn't have any little dogs at the dog pound. So we came home with something you could put a saddle on. <laughs> and I thought, it's how strange that a six-year-old, because I wasn't going to leave empty-handed. And I thought, how strange that a six-year-old boy would do that. And I said, did you want to breed this dog and sell the puppies for $500? He said, no, nah, we just wanted it to run rabbits in the woods. I said, so you didn't want to put it in the Westminster Dog Show? He said, what's that? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> now, people will tell you that a first-hand account in historical research is the most trustworthy thing you can have. And I disagree. I think documentation is better, and you need to back it up. Because, I mean, just for an example, if I said, what did you have for breakfast? And you had six jelly donuts, there is no way you're going to admit that. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes first-hand accounts can, can be um, untrustworthy for various reasons. Or people will claim to know things they don't know in order to seem important. So, in this case, however, Ward Burton could have passed a lie detector test telling you that dog story. It is true, absolutely, as he told it. But does it make sense? It does not. And I contend, as a researcher, if you come across a story that does not make sense, you are missing a piece of the puzzle. And until you find that piece of the puzzle, you cannot go forward. So I waited. I didn't write that story. Didn't make sense. A year later, I happened to be in South Boston, Virginia, hanging out with Ward, and his father walked in. So I told the winner of the Daytona 500 to sit down and shut up because I was going to talk to Daddy. And I said, Mr. Burton, tell me about when your son got his first dog. And Johnny said, oh, Rebel the First. They named all their dogs Rebel. They're an original family. And he said, well, let me see. I was driving down Highway 15501 headed for Durham. And I saw this little purebred beagle puppy in the median between the two roads with his head stuck in a mayonnaise jar. <laughs> he had tried to get the last bit out and got stuck. So Mr. Burton pulled the car off to the side of the road. He went over to the puppy and tried to get the jar off its head and it wouldn't come. So he took a rock and broke the jar. And the thing still had the rim of the jar around his neck. So he took the puppy home. And they took one of those steel files and filed the glass to free the puppy. And he said, then we kept that puppy. And Ward's jumping up and down going, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, now here's the question the trained researcher asks. Mr. Burton, that mayonnaise dog, did he die when Ward was six years old? And his father said, yes, how did you know? And I said, because now that crazy story makes sense. Beagles have patterns. They're brown and white, but various different configurations. So you take the six-year-old boy, and you put him in the car, and you take him to the farm, and he looks at the puppies, and he goes, my dog's not here. He is trying to match the markings on Rebel the First. And he holds out until he finds a puppy who looks exactly like Rebel the First. But 40 years later, when he was telling me that story, he had forgotten about the first beagle. He just remembered how picky he was, but he forgot why. So when I heard this story about Tom and Laura eloping, I said to my researchers, boys, we are missing a beagle. <laughs> Tom is not the one we want. Let's find that human beagle because there's somebody else in this story and until we find him, it's not going to make sense. And we did find him. 
We had to check census records and maps and everything, but the most chilling moment was when I figured out who he was, because he's mentioned twice in the trial transcript and once in a newspaper account. And I called Christy Earp, the librarian at Wilkes, and I said, I want you to look for a guy. I think his name is this. He's going to be 22 or 23 years old. He's going to live either here or here. I gave her all this. He's going to be a farmer. All the spec specifications I could think of. She called me back in an hour and she said, I found him. And I said, where does he live? And she said, right next to the Bates place where Laura died. And it all made sense. So that's how we do research. And that's, um, that's why I think that this book adds to the history of this story beyond what the folk tales and the folk songs were giving you. This actually makes sense of those fragments of truth and puts them together so that they finally do make sense. Thank you.